Ladies and gentlemen, gold is one of the most important means to preserve personal liberty. Government is the most important threat to personal liberty. It is therefore not surprising that gold and the state had a very strenuous relationship <laughs> from times immemorial. In my talk, I will try to highlight certain aspects of and walk you first through some considerations, basic considerations, relating to the relationship between gold and liberty. And then we'll talk about the relationship between gold and money. And finally, I will zoom into the main subject, which is gold and the, well, the, the state and the gold market. As far as the relationship between gold and liberty is concerned, I can be brief. Liberty certainly includes the notion of independence, independence as concerned uh, relative to the, the forces of nature, but also as con, uh, relative to uh, other human beings. Man can never be completely independent. There's no such thing as absolute independence. There's no such thing as absolute liberty. Uh, certainly easy if you're, if you're uh, a believer, if you're a Christian, I guess for, for Muslims, probably the same thing. And you, you always realize how much we are dependent on, on God's work and God that he was maintaining all laws of nature and uh, laws of, uh, of society, which without his will would not exist. So we certainly cannot do uh, without that sort of, of uh, dependence. But we can be relative, uh, relatively independent of other human beings, especially we have to distinguish in social relationships between uh, voluntary interdependence or voluntary dependence and coerced uh, dependence. The problem with the government is that it brings us many forms of coerced dependence. Independence, relative independence, especially from other human beings, comes uh, in the form of, or comes with wealth. So, uh, this is one of the greatest uh, benefits of accumulating wealth is that it makes us relatively independent, uh, both of the forces of nature the caprices of mother nature, so to say, and also the caprices of our fellow human beings. And among wealth, the most important, or one of the most important forms is money. Money is important because it is the most liquid form of wealth, right? money being by definition a generally accepted medium of exchange. So one benefit of money is that we can use it immediately. If we have a piece of land, you can use its value, but only by first selling it. I mean, you can use the, the, the piece of land to gaze our cows and uh, to set up a swimming pool. I don't know what, or have nice walks. But uh, in order to transform its value into other things, we first have to sell it. And this might take a while, as we all know. So the advantage of money is that we can immediately use it to acquire all other goods that are for sale. And from a political point of view, of course, the greatest benefit of this very liquid asset is that it is transportable. We cannot pack our piece of land into our suitcase and just walk away. It's also very difficult to do this with, with a factory that we have set up, or a nice family home, and so on. We cannot do this. And precisely for this reason, there is this strenuous relationship between the owners of money and the government. Because the owners of money can just, when it gets really hard to hard, they can just walk away. Among all types of money, the so-called natural monies, silver, gold, uh, to some extent also copper, but essentially silver and gold, also stand out. Silver and gold are natural monies. That is, they would be used as media of exchange and have been used as media of exchange generally accepted media of exchange, even without any government support. And they have been so used because of their natural qualities, their natural physical qualities. It's not something that has been uh, created by some act of legislation. It's simply their natural physical qualities, such as homogeneity, uh, divisibility, malleability, uh, a very high purchasing power per unit of weight, and unit of volume. And in our days, most importantly, gold and silver are nobody's liability. You can own gold and silver without being indebted to anybody else. That is not the case, of course, if we own, for example, a, a stock in a company that is itself heavily indebted. So today we imagine ourselves being the owner of that much wealth, and tomorrow we find that the, the company has gone, gone bankrupt, bankrupt in our 
um, value our wealth has evaporated. Not so in the case of gold and silver. Of course, their, their market price varies as well, but the asset itself, the economic good itself, is not uh, affected by uh, the caprices of, of business fortune. It's nobody's liability. And lastly, uh, but not least, gold and silver are costly to produce. And therefore, they have an inbuilt natural scarcity. They have an inbuilt insurance against uh, very fast, very strong depreciation of their purchasing power, something that no fiat money can offer. Fiat money, too, is technically no, nobody's liability. And if we take a banknote, right? So this is, this is a Turkish banknote. And this is technically, this is a, a liability of the central bank, of the Turkish central bank. So it is debt. But it's, of course, a very special type of, of liability, right? It's, from a juridical point of view, it's a, it's a liability. Practically, economically, it is an independent good. If we appeared uh, with this in hand at the uh, counter of, of the Turkish Central Bank, or we take a euro note and we go to the Banque de France or wherever else, we smash this on the, on the table and say, give me my money. This is debt. I want you to pay back your debt. Then the poor guy at the counter will not know what we're talking about. <laughs> right? So in desperation, he might, might give us two, five <laughs> euro notes. Right? <laughs> give him some money. Right? So it is no, nobody's liability, right? So in that respect, right, uh, fiat money shares the advantage with uh, natural monies, with uh, gold and silver, but gold and silver on top of this have the advantage of being costly to produce. It's impossible to just, out of a sleight of hand, create more gold and more silver from one day to the other. It's impossible to do what, for example, the European Central Bank has done last year, uh, that is in 2011, when they increased the money supply by more than one-third. Impossible. Now, let us turn to the relationship between the state and money. The state's business is coercion, and the main motivation is, of course, to acquire revenues and wealth for some people who would not have acquired such revenue and such wealth uh, on the basis of purely voluntary social relations. Right? They want to enrich themselves at the expense of others. And as we all know, right, the, the forms of government have been uh, changing very much in the course of history, and uh, democracy is also is a very innovative and uh, creative way of uh, including uh, the support of, of a great many people into the this, this scheme of exploitation because you, at least you hold out the promise to everybody that he could be potentially the beneficiary of coercion, right, of the rule of man over man. Right? So yeah, we are supporting the government because we might ourselves be one of the beneficiaries. Right? This is what Bastiat called uh, the, the great uh, illusion. Right? The government is the great illusion that gives to everybody the the idea, the, the notion that he could win at the expense of all others. So the business of government is coercion in the service of the acquisition of revenue, excessive revenue, excessive wealth. And this concerns, of course, uh, most notably uh, taxation, but it also concerns uh, uh, bullying uh, people into lending money to the government. Right? In modern parlance, this is called financial repression. Right? If through government intervention, to some, uh, through some form of coercion, I pressure people, I threaten people into handing or lending me more money than I would otherwise have obtained for, uh, through them, uh, we talk of financial repression. So this is the core business of, uh, of, of government. In, uh, until, former, uh, until the 16th, 17th century, uh, approximately, uh, taxation was relatively low because taxation is a very costly business. Uh, you need to hire people, arm them, uh, send them out, have, have, have troops all over the country, and so on. It's a costly business, especially if taxation becomes too high, then people tend to resist. Uh, financial repression is also a costly business. Well, first of all, there are uh, mo most people in former times have not been very wealthy, right? So the government naturally focused on those very wealthy merchant families, such as the the Fuggers, right? And, uh, 
uh, in Augsburg in, in Germany and, and coerced them, right? Uh, Charles uh, the, the V was coercing them into handing over money, lending the, the crown more and more uh, money until eventually uh, the war was unsuccessful, that the, the emperor was leading, so he couldn't pay back his loans because he would have paid out of the loot. It didn't work, and, and Fugger went bankrupt. So that is what you get when you uh, do business with a mugger. Right, the fugger and the mugger. <laughs> right. So all of this was limited simply also because well, the, the general economic development was not very advanced. Then, but then governments from time immemorial also did something else. They tried to uh, have a control over the creation of money. And this came by and large in two forms. One was uh, a form that in principle would have been open to every private citizen as well. Namely the idea of creating money out of nothing. And that was the, so the idea that you could create gold and silver out of something of lesser value at, at low cost. Right. So this was the idea, one of the projects, not the only one, one, one of the famous projects of the medieval alchemists. Right. That's the, the main project of alchemy. Right. You want to create gold out of some unknown yet fifth element, uh, etc. So I, I won't go into this. And uh, so the, the alchemists were actually employed so by, by wealthy people, but also by, um, uh, by princes, of course, until roughly the 17th and early 18th century, as soon as governments experienced the benefits of paper money and of fiat money, they started firing the alchemists. <laughs> <laughs> so we, this gets us to the, the second way our governments try to get a hold of money, because right, Taxation, confiscation is expensive. Why not choose the less costly way of getting additional revenue, additional wealth through the manipulation of the very medium of exchange through which we acquire all other things? And here governments in the, in the course of history have done essentially three things. They have first of all debased the currency. Secondly, they have promoted uh, fractional reserve banking and other fraudulent business schemes. And thirdly, they have uh, imposed fiat money. Now, I've ex explained in some of my research that there is actually a logical sequence between all these uh, uh, events. Most notably, right, there is a transition roughly in the sixth, uh, 17th, 18th century between the traditional way of inflating the money supply, which has been debasement. Right? So you, you, you mix, you, you, you transform the coins, right? you have uh, whatever, uh, uh, traditional denarius, right? A traditional silver coin, which typically contained about four grams of silver. And so what the governments then did, they, they continued uh, minting those coins, but only they put just three grams and then two grams and one gram and so on silver in, and substituted the rest by a base metal, and but still called it by the same name and insisted that these new coins be treated on equal footing with the old coins, so that's, that's debasement. And debasement, it's true, in the short run, it fills up the uh, treasury of the, of the government, but in the medium and long run, it has very substantial disadvantage, even disadvantages, even for the, the government itself, because uh, it, uh, uh, as soon as the population realizes, well, there, there are these new coins, and well, <laughs> those guys have been doing this for a couple of times already in the past, so now we know the trick, Right, the first thing they do is to start hoarding the good old coins that have a higher metallic content. Right, so as soon as uh, this, this trick becomes known, people react, and by reacting, they offset the, uh, the intended consequences from the point of view of the government, and especially they create negative consequence because they create a deflationary shock, so tax revenue diminishes, uh, government enterprises work less well, and so on. Right? So government itself is hurt by this. Therefore, comes the transition of approximately in the 17th, 18th century toward banking and uh, uh, the use of, of banknotes and bank deposits as money substitutes. And eventually, uh, with the first experience again in the 17th century, but then especially in the 19th and 20th century, the imposition of fiat money. Fiat money is uh, largely dematerialized money, so we would include here paper money, we include this as well, but especially electronic money. So largely dematerialized money uh, that uh, is 
imposed on the so everybody is, impo uh, is, is uh, supposed to use this because of uh, monopoly laws and legal tender laws in particular. Uh, one early example was the American greenback, right, in, imposed during the uh, War of Secession, uh, the Civil War in, in the 1860s. Now clearly these techniques, promoting fractional reserve banks and promoting uh, imposing fiat money are possible only because the government is already in the coercion business. If the government had to compete with other providers of security services, it could not just impose a bad type of money on the market because people would be free to choose another type of money and there would be competition between the traditional natural monies, gold and silver, and, and the new bad monies that the government wants the population to use. So this wouldn't get very far, wouldn't get, wouldn't get off the ground. So it's only because the government is already the monopoly coercer, right? it's, it's the monopoly on violence uh, in a given territory that it can impose these fraudulent and coercive schemes. Now the interesting thing is, and this brings us to our present situation, the interesting thing is that it creates uh, thereby two other consequences that have hitherto been neglected by Austrian scholars. The first uh, consequence is that by, uh, through fiat money comes the tendency for financial markets to grow. This is a very well-known empirical fact uh, as you can easily derive from the statistics of the 20th century. Uh, financial markets including banking, but not only banking, have grown relative to GDP in all countries, and especially, of course, in developed countries. And the reason, ladies and gentlemen, is that under a fiat money regime in which the money supply is constantly increased and significantly increased, in which, therefore, there is a constant price inflation, it is suicidal to hoard money. And money hoarding was the traditional way of using one's savings. Uh, traditionally, what, what people did with their savings were two things. Either they invested them in their own company, or they hoarded them. Uh, a few people were also buying government bonds and so on. Right? <laughs> That's true, especially if the government asked them. You shouldn't, there's an offer that you cannot refuse. <laughs> uh, but usually what people would do is either to spend the money on their own business, or to hoard it. Now that is suicidal in a fiat money regime. Right? If you hoard your, even if you have a relatively stable monetary uh, zone in which the inflation rate is just 2%, after 20 years, the money that you've hoarded in the first year is, has just 50% of its purchasing power left. Right? So this is not a wise way of using your savings, especially if you want to hand it over to your children, grandchildren, and so on. So what, people, what do people need to do? Well, uh, they need to uh, use their savings to buy things that will increase in price with the general pricing inflation. That is why today all people, all young people, as soon as they have a job, get into debt in order to buy real estate. Uh, something that is un unthought of in, in previous centuries simply because people were living under different conditions. They do this today. It's perfectly rational from an individual point of view. And one other thing uh, that people do is to buy financial assets. They buy stocks, they buy bonds, and so on, because here they are, so the, the prices of these assets tend to grow with the general progression of the price level. So the investment that you make in year one, if everything goes well, uh, will by and large be the same in, in year 20, and uh, if you have wisely invested, you might even have uh, earned some returns, so this is a wise way of, of investing savings. So therefore, as a consequence of fiat money, we have an artificial grow, growth of financial markets, banking, but also insurance, investment funds, and so on. Now, the second consequence, and it's related to this, is that it's easier now for governments to tap personal wealth. Again, in former times, how could they have tapped personal wealth? Go into the company and say, well, uh, you, you now you fire people and you hand the money over to me, uh, you, they get a social revolution. Or go in there and say, now you get your money out of your gold hoards, and then everybody say, well, gold hoard? What are you talking about? I don't have a gold hoard. 
right? So it wasn't possible. But once the essence of savings is invested on financial markets, all the government needs to do is to threaten the intermediaries. Because for most people, it's impossible to do all of this themselves. So they go through banks, they go through insurance companies, they go through investment firms. And now what the government does is to tell those guys how best to use their funds. And guess what is the best use of those funds? Secure investment in government bonds. Right. And of course, they, it, right, they don't appear like, like in the 16th century, right, the muggers of the fuggers. <laughs> they now appear right, as financial regulators concerned about preserving wealth in the economy. So we regulate uh, insurance companies, we regulate investment trusts and so on in a way that, well, you have to have a certain minimum of your investment in secure government bonds, such as Greek government bonds, for example. So in 2010, as a, so the present situation is today is that in 2010, uh, of the, the major countries, uh, industrialized and financial countries, uh, where we have the least uh, government share in financial savings, uh, was the UK. Out of all financial savings in the UK, so there are also right, real savings in the form of real estate, uh, uh, is the, the other main form, but out of financial savings, 26% have been invested in government bonds, or have been lent to the government. In Germany, it was 35%. In France, 34 In the US, 27 And in Japan, 46%. This is enormous. And especially by historical standards, this is an enormous sum of money. So government is not just tapping income, right? taxing current income, it's tapping wealth on a massive scale. Now, in this, it is in this context that the gold market is of, of particular interest. So I, I take the liberty of three more minutes, but I, I started five minutes late, so I'll, I'll go on for another five minutes. Right. The state and gold. State and gold, as I said, is a strenuous history, and we can distinguish more, by and large, four main phases, four typical phases, and sometimes they repeat themselves, but I'll just name them. The first phase is to, for the government to impo impose gold. This may come as a surprise to, to some, because uh, gold is, seems to be the alternative of free market money, but actually gold uh, itself is impractical for most daily transactions. Gold's purchasing power is too high. And if we take a very small gold coins, you take a f uh, 20 franc uh, gold coin, which is a standard gold coin in Europe, contains about six grams of, uh, of gold. Uh, that has a purchasing power of 200 euros or 250. Right? So, I mean, you cannot buy a cup of coffee, coffee with this. And, and unless you have a very big family, you cannot even do your gro groceries. <laughs> right? So, right, so the, the silver was therefore, was in fact the, the, the natural uh, money for most economies for most uh, uh, times. So what the government did then in imposing gold was to create uh, the following problem for the population. Well, they actually they couldn't pay most of the things that they would buy with gold. So you need to use something else. You need to use money substitutes, some form of substitute. So by imposing this law, the government made the people dependent on the intermediaries, banks, came to play a bigger role. The government itself, who sometimes produced uh, 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 token coins and so on, came to play a bigger role in uh, the production of money. And of course, it's much easier to inflate the money supply once you control uh, the co token coin production and once you control fractional reserve banking. The second phase consisted in the government in diluting uh, the gold standard that it had initially created. The gold standard, after all, it allowed initially for the expansion of the money supply. But after all, because you're under the obligation to redeem all money substitutes into gold, you're still constrained. So the government tried to dilute those constraints more and more. And this gave us, in the, in the 20th century, the transition from the classical gold standard that prevailed until World War I through the gold exchange standard of the 1920s to uh, the Bretton Woods system that we had for, uh, in the post-war, immediate post-war period. Uh, 
And I, if you are interested in the uh, historical uh, progression, uh, you can uh, find these things in my book on the ethics of money production. The third phase consisted in the government then in banning gold, right? So this, this comes always with a suspension, so-called suspension of payments. They finally declare, well, we, we will no longer redeem our money substitutes into gold. Okay. So at that point then, uh, we have the creation of fiat money. The dollars that were before redeemable into gold, so were therefore just a money substitute, become an independent economic good, become money of its own. They become fiat money. And now it seems that everything is fine for the government, right? They have fiat money, they can create as much money as they wish. Okay, they have to deal with the central banks, but central banks are loyal uh, servants by and large. Uh, so everything seems to be fine. But still, the amazing thing is that we, in the past uh, 30, 40 years, we observed governments fighting gold, and uh, central banks in particular fighting uh, gold, that is especially trying to prevent a rise of the gold price on the, on the gold market. Why is this? Well, the basic reason, sometimes you find the, 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 the standard argument that you would find if you ask an average libertarian, you would say, well, uh, the progression of the gold price indicates uh, how much uh, inflation the government creates. Right? So it's, it's a bad uh, uh, pupil certificate, so to say, that comes from, from the gold market. Right? The gold price rises and rises, so it means, well, you guys, you are really inflating the money supply. This is very bad. But in fact, they don't care. Right? <laughs> they don't care how, how much prices rises. You don't have to look at the gold price in order to know that the prices rise. The main uh, reason why uh, governments and therefore central banks are interested in the gold price is because gold is the natural alternative to our current fiat monies. It is, after all, a money. It is not the official money, right? but it is a money. It is a natural means of exchange. And more than that, gold is uh, an alternative store of value. It is still possible. And in an inflationary period, it is even recommendable to own gold and use this as a way to invest your savings. Right? Because generally, you can expect that the, the value of your monetary value of your savings will rise with the general progression of, uh, of prices. And in particular, in the current situation in which we have a very large fragility of financial markets, in which uh, uh, virtually all financial intermediaries are highly leveraged, that is, they are. Uh, excessively in debt. Governments are ex excessively in debt. So we have a very fragile uh, economic financial situation in which it is possible to lose one's wealth if it's just invested in financial assets from one day to the other. There is an additional incentive to invest in gold, which is, as we have seen, nobody's liability. Right? So you don't run this risk. And therefore, governments, and central banks in particular, have tried to prevent uh, a steady and a significant rise of the gold price through various techniques. And uh, this is uh, not just a hypothesis, it's something that we can derive from various statements made over the 20, uh, 30 uh, years of uh, the past years by central banks officials, starting from Paul Volcker in the early 1980s. And Volcker said, well, one of my biggest errors was to let the gold price rise. Uh, gold is the enemy. He also said this, gold is the enemy. So what does this mean, to let the gold price rise? That means, well, he could have prevented it, and apparently some people told him to prevent it, and he did not. Didn't pay sufficient attention to this. So how do uh, uh, central banks today try to prevent <coughs> increases of the gold price? Uh, well, they are, just to give you a few uh, examples, I will not make a complete statement because I, I'm running out of time. Uh, one thing is, uh, of course, the threat of confiscation. Gold has been confiscated uh, already in the early 1930s under the Roosevelt administration. So this is something that is supposed to dampen your enthusiasm for, for gold. Could happen again. Uh, then uh, financial regulation uh, tries to, uh, or has the, the, effect, the effect of steering financial intermediaries away from investing in gold and rather keep them invested in, uh, in government, uh, government bonds and government bills. And uh, finally, there are also, uh, there's been much uh, speculation in the past 15 years on uh, the rigging of the gold price through central banks. For example, bank, central banks might have 
lend out uh, gold that they themselves owned to commercial banks with whom they cooperate and have the commercial banks sell this gold on the gold market and in particular on the derivatives markets where you can do with less investment, you can have uh, a multiple effect or the, the same effect. And uh, so there's been much speculation about this in the past, but I would say today the issue is pretty much settled because we have statements to this effect coming from former employees of the Federal Reserve and also uh, former employees of uh, European central banks uh, that conclusively demonstrate that this is going on, is indeed going on. And as uh, one uh, economist, uh, I, for those of you who are interested in this subject matter, I recommend that you read um, an article written by Chris Martinson, is, a, is an economist who put some of his research on the internet, M-A-R-T-E-N-S-O-N. -E and he uh, starts off with a very commonsensical observation that, well, central banks actually, they, they try to manage all kinds of markets, right, from the oil market over uh, the bond market, stock, uh, stock exchange market, why should they not try to manage the gold market? And in fact, as we know from historical experience, that's what they have been doing all the time. So it would be rather surprising if it were not the case. So we know it has been the case and for the reasons that I've mentioned. So in conclusion, then, let me say that um, uh, owning gold and using gold are among the most efficient ways of sidestepping and even counteracting the state dominance not only over money, but also over our financial savings and financial markets in general and uh, human liberty even more generally. Thank you for your attention.